Treponema pallidum is a gram-negative bacterium that causes syphilis. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, and it affects the skin and mucous membranes of the external genitalia, and also sometimes the mouth. Treponema pallidum is an obligate parasite bacteria, meaning that it can't survive outside of a living body. To be more specific, that's the human being's body. They belong to a group of bacteria called spirochetes, which are long and thin and contain endoflagella, which is a band of protein filaments that coil within the spirochetes and give them a spirally shape, kind of like a curly fry, but less appetising. The endoflagella also help the spirochetes to move around, by spinning or twisting. It's a bit like a drill that's slowly boring into a piece of wood. People that have syphilis can transmit the disease in one of two ways. The first way is called acquired syphilis, and it's when treponema pallidum enters the body through body fluids. That can happen when there are tiny cuts or breaks in the skin or mucous membranes of the external genitalia or the mouth when there's sexual contact, including oral, anal and vaginal sex. It can also happen when people share contaminated needles, or when they have direct contact with the skin lesion of an infected person, because the lesion is covered in this fluid which is rich in spirochetes. The second way is called congenital syphilis, and it's when a mother has syphilis and treponema pallidum infects the baby, either in the uterus or while the baby exits through the vagina at birth. In acquired syphilis, there are three stages to the infection. The first stage is called primary syphilis, or the early localised stage, and it usually starts one to three weeks after the T. pallidum lands on the skin or mucous membrane. During this stage, the spirochetes destroy the soft tissue in the skin wherever they enter the body, and that results in the formation of ulcers called syphilitic chancres. A syphilitic chancre is actually painless, and you can remember that by dropping in a U to make it chancure, like you're cured of the pain, if you know what I mean. These chancres have a hard base, raised borders, and are usually covered in a fluid rich in spirochetes, and this can spread to other parts of the body as well as other individuals. In individuals who acquire syphilis through sexual contact, the primary chancre develops around the external genitalia. However, for individuals that acquire syphilis by physically touching the lesion, or in some other way, the primary chancre might appear on the hands or some other part of the body. Syphilitic chancres typically heal on their own over a few months, but during that time, some spirochetes go to nearby lymph nodes, where they cause lymphadenopathy, which is lymph node enlargement, and then they get into the lymph, and finally into the bloodstream. If syphilis is acquired through something like a blood transfusion, then there may not be an early localised stage at all, and no primary chancre. The second stage is secondary syphilis, or the dissemination stage, and it occurs about 6-12 to 12 weeks after the infection. During this stage, spirochetes enter the bloodstream, which is called spirochetemia, and this causes generalised lymphadenopathy, which is when spirochetes can be found in lymph nodes throughout the body. The spirochetes like to attach to and infect endothelial cells in small capillaries near the skin. This causes non-itchy maculopapular rash, which are small bumps that are either flat or raised. The rash starts on the trunk and then spreads out to the arms and legs, and eventually to the palms, soles, genitalia and other mucous membranes. These rashes can sometimes be pustular, which means they're filled with a white fluid, pus, or they can be papulosquamous, which is when they're scaly and hard. In addition, there can be something called condylomalata, which are smooth, white, painless, wart-like lesions, and they appear in moist areas like genitals, around the anal region and the armpits. So, these various rashes can erupt all over the body, and the lesions are chock-a-block full of spirochetes, which makes secondary syphilis the most infectious stage. The rashes from secondary syphilis usually resolve within a few weeks to months. Then, after secondary syphilis is a latent phase, called latent syphilis. This is when the disease enters a dormant or asymptomatic phase. During this phase, the spirochetes can mostly be found in the tiny capillaries of various body organs and tissues. Latent syphilis can be further divided into an early phase and a late phase. 
Early latent syphilis occurs within a year of infection, and during that time, the spirochetes can re-enter the blood. So this means that during early latent syphilis, they can still be found circulating in large numbers in the blood, causing symptoms of secondary syphilis. However, the late latent phase is generally after a year, and that's because the spirochetes generally stay within the tiny capillaries of various body organs and tissues. As it turns out, there are actually only very few spirochetes which are found in the capillaries of tissues and organs. But there is a severe immune response, so severe that it causes a tremendous amount of damage to the cells there. And that triggers the next stage, which is tertiary syphilis. In tertiary syphilis, there's a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, which means that there's an immune response that's mainly led by T-cells, and they recruit phagocytes, like macrophages, and cause the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. All of this leads to local swelling, or edema, as well as redness, warmth and systemic symptoms like a fever. T. pallidum has three main antigens. These include group-specific antigen, which is present on all treponemas, species-specific antigen, which is specific to T. pallidum, and cardiolipin, which is a lipid antigen, which interestingly is present within the spirochetes as well as cells in our body. Now, plasma cells like to get themselves involved in the immune reaction by producing antibodies against these antigens. In some cases, the immune cells start to huddle around and form a granulomatous lesion called a gumma, and this has lots of different types of immune cells that get surrounded by an outermost layer of fibroblasts. Often, funnily enough, there aren't any spirochetes at all in these lesions. It's just like the immune cells are getting overexcited and huddling up for no obvious reason. The tissue at the centre of the gumma often ends up without oxygen, and that can lead to coagulative necrosis. In tertiary syphilis, various organs get damaged, like the heart and blood vessels, called cardiovascular syphilis, the brain and spinal cord, called neurosyphilis, and also the liver, joints and testes, which haven't actually earned their own special names yet. In cardiovascular syphilis, you can get something called endarteritis, which is inflammation of the tiny arterioles called the vasophosorum, and these supply the large arteries like the aorta. The result is that parts of the aorta are damaged, and you can get something called aortitis, or inflammation of the aorta, and this can cause aortic aneurysms. In neurosyphilis, the spirochetes set up camp in the capillaries supplying the posterior, or back, of the spinal cord, and this can result in something called tabes dorsalis, which literally translates as wasting or loss of the back of the spinal cord. The protective sheath which covers the nerves running along the back of the spinal cord is damaged, and this results in a loss of vibration sensation and a loss of proprioception, which is the sense of the position of the joints and other body parts, like the hands and foot. So that's what happens when syphilis damages the posterior spinal cord, but sometimes the spirochetes invade the capillary supplying the anterior, or front of the spinal cord, and that results in general paresis, which causes loss of sensation and weakness, and sometimes even paralysis, mostly in the legs. If spirochetes get into the capillaries serving the brain, then that can cause slurred speech, altered behaviour, memory loss, difficulty coordinating muscle movements, and even paralysis. Syphilis can also affect the eye, causing something called argyle robertson pupil, which is when the pupil loses its light reflex, but it does still have its accommodation reflex, which means that the pupil constricts when there's a nearby object. It just doesn't do anything when it's too light. In congenital syphilis, the spirochetes can infect the baby either via the placenta or during childbirth in the birth canal. In early disease, which is in the first two years, the result can range from a baby being stillborn or dying within the womb, to having classic features like a macular papula rash on the palms and soles of the feet, and snuffles, which is when the nose is blocked by increased secretions, and these contain spirochetes. Babies may also have organ damage to the liver and spleen, causing hepatosplenomegaly, 
and damage to the eyes as well, like optic neuritis. In late disease, which is after a child is two years old, classic features often include a saddle nose, which is a bony destruction of the nose, sabre shins, which is when the tibia gets bent, Hutchinson's teeth, which is when the teeth develop little notches, and hearing loss. Diagnosis of acquired syphilis starts with identifying the spirochetes in the fluid from Shankers, and this can be done using dark field microscopy. A dark field microscope shines thin slivers of light on a slide so that the background appears dark, while the extremely thin spirochetes light up. It's a bit like, you know how we can see dust particles better when there's a dark room and just a thin stream of light shining through the door? It's kind of like that. Now, the diagnosis is confirmed with serological tests, and these look for antibodies against the T-pallidum antigens. There are non-treponemal tests, like the Rapid Plasma Regain Test, or RPR, and the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test, or VDRL, and these detect anti-cardiolipin antibodies, called Regain, in the blood. The key, though, is that these are not specific to syphilis. For example, cardiolipin is also released by damaged cells in our bodies. Then we have the treponemal tests, which includes t pallidum particle agglutination, or TPPA, and fluorescent treponemal antibody absorbed, or FTA-ABS. These treponemal tests detect antibodies that specifically target T. pallidum. Diagnosing congenital syphilis, as you might imagine, is a bit different. In congenital syphilis, the diagnosis involves having a look at the mother's and baby's results in parallel. For example, if a baby's non-treponemal serological titer is four times greater than the mother's titer, like if the baby's RPR is 1 to 16 and the mother's RPR is 1 to 64, then that suggests that the baby has congenital syphilis. In general, for any baby whose mother was inadequately treated for syphilis or is suspected of having congenital syphilis for a different reason, it's helpful to get CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid, for VDRL, as well as cell counts and protein. It's also helpful to perform long bone x-rays as well as an eye exam and a hearing screen. The main treatment for syphilis is penicillin, but in some cases doxycycline can be used as well. When using penicillin though, it's important to watch out for yarish herxheimer reaction, which is when spirochetes die and break open, releasing a lot of antigens all at once, and this makes the immune system go into overdrive. When that happens, it results in sudden fevers, sweating, and muscle and joint pains that may last for a few hours to a few days. All right, so we've made it to the end of the syphilis video. Now we've got time just to quickly recap the main points. So syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease and it's caused by a spirochete called treponema pallidum. It can cause disease in three stages. The first is localized primary syphilis and this produces hard chancres. The second is disseminated secondary syphilis which produces widespread macular papular rash. And the third, is a systemic tertiary syphilis and it affects various organs. Syphilis can be diagnosed by using serological tests and treated with antibiotics like penicillin.